symbolizes the courage and steadfastness of the Issei pioneers who created Nihon Machi, Japantown. Next to the Issei Pioneer Stone, we have the Nikkei Lantern Monument. Lights along the sides of the lantern end at the torch at the top, representing hope. Importantly, embedded in the bend of the lantern is the date, February 19, 1942. On that date, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which changed the community forever. Each year, our traditional Day of Remembrance candlelight procession solemnly walks past this lantern in remembrance of that significant event. I'm Becky Shibayama, and I'm with the Nihon Machi Outreach Committee and the Campaign for Justice, Redress Now for Japanese Latin Americans. I am standing in front of the Civil Liberties Monument on the grounds of the historic Issei Memorial Building in San Jose, Japantown. The Civil Liberties Monument is one of three monuments commemorating the only three Japan towns remaining in the U.S., San Jose, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. The three sides of the monument depict the history and experiences common to all three Japan towns and Japanese Americans in general, immigration and settlement, World War II internment, and celebration of festivals. This remarkable monument has images that capture the forced removal of Japanese Americans from their homes in Japantown and the surrounding areas. This great violation of civil rights and human dignity was finally acknowledged by the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. The federal act that granted an official presidential apology and reparations was a historic moment for the Japanese American community. However, Many incarcerees were left out of the apology, including my family and over 2,200 Japanese Latin Americans. The Campaign for Justice continues our fight to resolve this unfinished business with the steadfast support of other community groups. Hi, I'm Vicki Takeda, board member of the Japantown Community Congress, the Japantown Neighborhood Association, and a San Jose State alum. As young adults in the 60s and 70s, we found ourselves at a time where students and community activism linked arms and met at the crossroads in the wake of the civil rights movement to challenge the social injustices towards people of color and the institutional narratives of our nation's history. Our local colleges and universities provided platforms where the nation's narrative was challenged with demands for inclusion by students and our community of color. UC Berkeley students pushed the envelope on freedom of speech. San Francisco State's Third World Strike Liberation Front demanded the inclusion of ethnic studies. And in the summer of 1968, San Jose State University became the epicenter in a collision between social activism and sports. Several decades before Colin Kaepernick and other athletes took a knee to protest systemic racism and violence directed at African Americans and other communities of color, there was Tommy Smith and John Carlos. At the 1968 Summer Olympics, San Jose State University sprinters, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, raised their gloved fist in a black power salute. They removed their shoes to symbolize black poverty as they stood on the metal stand. This past year, many Americans took to the streets demanding an end to the systemic racism and violence perpetrated against African Americans for generations. Along 5th Street is Issei Voices, a 36-foot-long granite monument etched with the words and phrases of traditional Japanese values brought by the Issei pioneers.
on top of the monument, we see a timeline that chronicles the evolution of a community, the traditions, organizations, and individuals that form the heart and soul of Nihonmachi. Ikai is a transplanted pilgrimage, an immersive dance project that explores the resilience of the Japanese American community, how we heal from generational trauma, and find ways to transform the violence enacted upon our forebears into compassion and strength that can be used to stand alongside others. So. It isn't like we were floundering community and then we had to go to camp and then we made this miraculous recovery. It, 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 would, it would have been ongoing uh, uh, if it weren't for the racism and the hatred that was there. So what we were in, this is one of the things, is internment camps are legal, federal, and international things. That there's a international policy that says if, if I go to war with your country and you're living here, and I suspect you of supporting the war effort on that side, I could put you in an internment camp, and you could do the same for me in Japan. That's just international law. But what happened to us, the, all the other camps, there's no international law. There was no oversight. Geneva Convention oversees all the Department of Justice internment camps. So when my father was removed from us in Tumi Lake, first he's put in the, put in the jail. So we have pictures of him in the jail. Uh, and then put into the internment camp in North Dakota, Bismarck, North Dakota. Uh, those internment camps were way better. They're red brick buildings, they had steam heat, uh, they had a swimming pool, because uh, the US government wanted to make sure that the Americans that were held over there were treated well. So they treated the enemy aliens, that's what they're called, well here, otherwise they would be punished. The, the Americans over there would be punished. They didn't realize is that nobody in Japan wanted my father because he was an American citizen. He, if he came over, he was probably going to be a spy for the U.S. <laughs> Such crazy stuff. Do you know what I remember the most? I'm only three years old, right? Is the fear on my mother's face. You don't have to tell me anything. I don't have to understand any of it. But a child knows fear of their parents. And that's what sticks to me the most, is the fear on my mother's face. But everything was positive, and while well, growing up, everything was positive. But the people that resisted or they deemed not loyal to the U.S. were sent to this one particular camp. Uh, they were then deported. A number of them were deported back to Japan. So it's, you know, it's what's happening today, you know? And that's what's so sad. 
You see, you hear about the Hispanic families being broken up, and you know the parents are just taken away, locked up, and it's awful. I mean, kids are kids. And kids get along, or they fight. The older kids, because I was in grade school, I mean, first grade or whatever. Uh, whereas the older kids, high school kids, they were very much discriminated against initially. This is in Seabrook Farm, New Jersey. And yeah, they... But in Seabrook, I say it's unique because of the Europeans, right? They were displaced people from Europe. So the Estonians, the Hungarians, the Polish, the Latvians, many different ethnic groups. The southern um, uh, migrant farmers, uh, migrant laborers, not farmers, from the south of the Appalachian Mountains would come to Seabrook during the harvest season. in a community that is in a rural setting that was very much like an urban setting of a lot of mixed cultures. So we grew up learning different languages and the Estonians were probably the most and largest group of that came but it's totally a mixed community and we were all in the same boat, poor. <laughs> or we're trying to reestablish ourselves. A new beginning because it was a new beginning for many people. We didn't realize that growing up as kids. You know, we grew up with different ethnic groups. And that became really a pride. Looking back on the history, is that you know we were able to get along. All the different cultures were all in the same boat in the sense of trying to recoup from the war. And so we managed. Hello, my name is Reiko Nakayama and welcome to the Nihonmachi Outreach Committee's 42nd Annual San Jose Day of Remembrance event. Although you can't be here with us because of the pandemic, we know that you're here in spirit. Since the very first San Jose Day of Remembrance program, the Wesley United Methodist Church has played an important role in our program and has been a prominent voice in the community in terms of justice, LGBT equality, human rights, and peace. And right now, we have Reverend Keith Inoue who will offer the traditional aspiration. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keith Inoue. I am the senior pastor of the Wesley United Methodist Church here in San Jose's Japantown. And I bring greetings from the members and friends of our church. We share the same concerns and hopes with so many in the community, nation, and world. We believe in the importance of remembering the history and injustice of the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II here in our country, knowing that our continued remembrance of this injustice 
80 years ago, keeps us mindful of others whose civil liberties are or might be at risk, and to stand in solidarity with those who are racially profiled and denied due process. The way forward to hope for all is certainly guided by what we have collectively experienced and learned from in the past. So may we never forget. I am honored to be asked to take part once more for this year's 42nd Day of Remembrance event organized by our Nihomachi Outreach Committee in collaboration with so many community organizations and organizers. Indeed, much thanks and appreciation to NOC. We lament with all of you that we cannot gather in person for this important remembrance. These last two years have indeed been so difficult, not only from the standpoint of the pandemic, but because the political climate and racism today um, experienced on so many fronts uh, feels like we are taking steps backward, not forward. A climate that has prompted such needed movements as Black Lives Matter and Stop Anti-Asian and Pacific Islander Hate. The systemic assault on so many people of color, our Muslim, Muslim sisters and brothers, our Jewish American sisters and brothers, immigrants, and our LGBTQ plus siblings. These and more are clear indications that we are still far from being a nation that truly reflects justice and equality for all. But I believe that we not only gather, um, we gather not in hate, but in hope. Hope for a more just nation and world where equality and protecting one another's dignity and inclusion must be the norm, the aspiration. So may we gather this annual day of remembrance in mutual support and hope, for we must know that we can achieve far more good together than we can alone. May our virtual gathering of this year's day of remembrance be blessed, true, truly blessed. Um, though we are apart, may we be one in spirit and in hope. Amen. Each year, we gather together to remember the signing of Executive Order 9066, which occurred exactly 80 years ago today. That order resulted in the incarceration of 120,000 people of Japanese descent. Not only do we remember that great civil liberties tragedy, but we also have the opportunity to reflect on what that event means to each of us today. The theme of our program is overcoming hate and fear. During these tumultuous times, we have witnessed violent hate crimes and racist acts, including horrific incidents directed towards multiple communities, including our own Asian American and Pacific Islander community. Since one of the driving forces behind the World War II Japanese American incarceration was attributed to racial prejudice, Many Japanese Americans feel compelled to join with other communities in denouncing hate, prejudice, and violence, and in continuing the fight for social justice. Sprinkled throughout today's program, you will hear remembrances from different Japanese Americans who will talk about how their families were locked up in concentration camps during a time of intense hatred and fear. It is my pleasure to introduce our featured remembrance speaker, Eiko Yamaichi. Well, I was studying in, in the living room and uh, I heard on the radio and, uh, and I 
is, of course, uh, surprised and shocked to hear about it. Uh, I went outside to see whether uh, anyone else was too, and surprisingly, uh, quite a few people came outside. So we were just flabbergasted that why would they do that? Why don't they leave well enough alone? You know, we were looking at each other and we felt really helpless and not knowing what was going to happen, but uh, had no inkling that it would affect us, but it certainly did. Oh, well, right away, uh, I felt they were very cool toward us, uh, you Japs. I was, I felt uncomfortable. And um, most of the teachers, they kind of ignored it. Uh, they didn't want to bring up the topic or anything. Uh, so I'd like to think that there was something beyond their control and that uh, they felt bad about it. But I don't know how true that would be. Uh, some of the teachers might have thought, well, we'll get rid of the Japs. You know? I don't know how long we went to school before that mandate came out. We had to cross number of streets and railroad tracks and what have you. And I think it was uh, beyond our curfew mileage, so we couldn't go to school. Yeah, first it came out in, uh, in uh, Life magazine, and then uh, we people, the Japanese people in Washington were saying, oh, how sad, that's too bad, you know. And then lo and behold, <laughs> The mandate came to us say that we were going to be evacuated, and holy smokes, you know. <laughs> My personal life is much different from the average. Uh, Nisei, uh, in that I was a mother figure when I was seven years old. My mother, I don't think she was a um, very happy person. Uh, in fact, she was a hypochondriac. I'd say, oh, my arm hurts and I need to go to bed. So that left me to do all the things that had to be done. And so I became the mother figure and I took care of my brother. And that was one of my desires to uh, go to college outside, but my father said, no, you can't go. No, oh, I mean, I, I can't go. And I knew why, but uh, <laughs> I never got to go. Well, who's going to take care of my mother? Important, and who's going to take care of my brother? So there I was. I mean, I knew why. What happened to me was uh, I got permission to go to Roar, Arkansas, which was close to Jerome, but not close enough where you could walk. You had to take a bus to get there. We went to the bus depot and the driver took a uh, rest period. And then um, in the meantime, I got off the bus and uh, I thought, well, I want to drink water and go to the restroom. Well, when I got to the faucet, it says, B-L-A-C-K, and over here is W-H-I-T-E, so the black and white. So I didn't know which I was, so I drank out of the black faucet. And then uh, the, the same thing happened in the uh, restroom, you know. So anyway, uh, I uh, uh, acted like I was black. I looked at that, and then in the back of the bus, it says black sit in back and white sit in front. So I didn't know where I fit. So I started walking past the bus driver and I was on the middle part of the bus and the driver is looking at the mirror in front of his uh, steering wheel. And uh, he says, hey, you, you know, so I looked around and I was the only one passenger there. And uh, I turned around and I pulled and turned to myself. Are you talking to me? And he said, yeah, you, you know. So he says, where are you going? And I said, I pointed to the sign, I says, Black, so I'm going there. He said, no. He said, come sit behind me. So I looked at him and said, you want me to sit behind you? And he said, yeah. So I did that. And then I found out that in order for the people to get on the bus, you have to get out to the highway and you go stretch your arm and flag the 
bus driver to stop because you want to get on the bus. Well, when that black people did that, he would open the door, he would stop the bus, and he would mutter, these goddamn blacks, you know, well, he didn't say blacks, he, he said the N word. And he, he did this multiple times every time those people got on. But when the white people got on, he never said anything. And um, I was thinking to myself, how sad that he's working at a job where he really dislikes certain kind of people and he's getting his frustration out by muttering those kind of words. So I, I really got an exposure of what the uh, Southern people really have to put up with. And it was really a learning experience. So when I got off the bus floor, I couldn't help but just blurt out the fact that I was so disappointed. And my auntie looked at me and she said, you know, that's a way of life for these people. So you can't change that. From the time they're born, they know that that's what's gonna happen. And I said, that's so unfair. She said, yes, it's unfair, but it's something we cannot do anything about. So there I was. And so on the return trip, I just kept my mouth shut and I just kept shaking my head. And I said, oh my gosh, here we go again. In our own United States, that was happening. And so it's just too bad, but I think it still exists today too. Those people don't really understand what we went through. Having to give up everything we owned and just carry whatever we needed or wanted. And that was it, and start life anew. And like the farmers had crops in their field ready to be picked. They had to leave that. They lost all that income. And people who worked for some employee, I mean, they don't understand all the hardship that we had to endure. We, ma we managed, but the, <laughs> when people say we had a good in camp, we got another thing coming. We try to make it livable. My involvement in Stop API Hate really comes from this idea that really community-based organizations are the first responders. We see an issue, we organize, and we try to um, solve problems. And sometimes there's societal systemic issues. Um, and when we saw the surge in anti-Asian racism that members of our community were being profiled, uh, targeted, and in some cases harmed, we joined with um, APCON and SF State University, the Asian American Studies Department to launch Stop API Hate in March um, of 2020. And we started Stop API Hate because we wanted to really understand what was happening, who it was happening to, where, uh, the nature of the hate that we were seeing reported in the media um, and also on social media platforms and so that we could respond, so we could develop solutions um, to addressing both the immediate harm, but also the root causes of systemic racism and discrimination in this country.
And honestly, we had no idea if community members, even uh, the fact that we provided um, it in language, if they would come onto our site and tell us very personal, horrifying stories um, of their experiences. And we heard from people, from everyday people in our community reporting incidents uh, and experiences that they had as individuals. They reported incidents of um, what their children experienced, their elderly parents. And um, I've been doing this work for a very, very long time. And even I was really stunned at the vitriol, uh, the level of hate and animus that was being directed towards our community members. Our reporting center takes in uh, these incident reports. We analyze them. We use them to develop public policy solutions. And one thing that I do want to note is that these are first-hand accounts of individuals who've experienced hate or they're reporting on behalf of somebody. And it's important for us to share that um, many of our respondents, in fact, the majority of our respondents, when we surveyed them, when we asked them why they decided to report their incident to us, um, was because they wanted to be a part of a collective voice and that they wanted a response. Um, so a majority of these incidents um, are not um, hate crimes in the sense that they are not hate incidents where there is a criminal element. What are you doing in this country? What am I doing in this country? We I'm an American people. citizen. Exactly, get in your car, stupid goop. Stay home and thanks for giving my country COVID. But that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be interventions. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't take these incidents seriously. And so um, this is what we uh, have been doing and we intend to keep doing this because what we've been able to do with our elected officials and heads of government agencies is to push for more investments around uh, addressing community safety, uh, promoting cross-racial solidarity, promoting um, alternatives to carceral approaches, because of course that's after the fact and we wanna prevent incidents of violence and harm from taking place. And um, this is the work that I think is uh, really important in terms of the types of investments that we wanna see, again, to address immediate harm, uh, as well as longer term solutions. In some ways, it's a really bittersweet time because we're finally being seen. Uh, our issues are getting the attention. And you can, you can see that there is um, more and more recognition um, from all sectors that this is an issue that affects us. And in this racial reckoning, it includes us. And we also don't wanna take away from the fact that other communities are also affected by systemic racism. The experience of Latinx communities, of um, the black community, um, of indigenous people, that we have an interest in really understanding that uh, this is part of our collective history and why I think, again, it, it's so important, even in this time, even in this really transformative um, year, uh, a year of grief and fear that we continue to stay engaged and we continue to push for action and that whatever we put forward, whatever we do, that we keep in mind that our goal here is to recognize our shared fate um, and to recognize that we must address harm against any community, uh, not just ours. And, and this is how we are going to come out of this period of uh, racial reckoning is by addressing uh, those systems that are pitting us against each other, that are working to ensure that we see each other as the enemy when the real enemy is white supremacy, uh, the real enemy is structural racism.
one of the things that my daughter always asks is, you know, she'd say, mommy, how, how does this happen? Right? How, how is there so much fear and distrust? Like, how does that get sewed into one's psyche? I mean, she didn't ask in that way, but that's essentially what her question is. Like, um, how does somebody learn to hate and to fear another person? You can watch our entire interview with Cynthia Choi on the Nihomachi Outreach Committee YouTube channel. You can hear Cynthia talk about topics such as what you can do to combat hate and what resources are available to you if you are a victim. Hi, my name is Rich Saito. I'm a member of a community emergency response team in Japantown called Japantown Prepared. Last year, when the anti-Asian hate crime started to become prevalent across the country, uh, Pam Yoshida, the co-president of the Japantown Community Congress, asked me to consider starting a volunteer patrol program to protect Japantown. So I did that. I put out the call using the press and social media, and I got an overwhelming response. I got over 300 people from throughout the greater Bay Area interested in volunteering their time and coming down to patrol and protect the neighborhood. So thanks to their efforts, we had no anti-Asian hate crimes. However, we need to continue to be vigilant, make sure that you're aware of your surroundings at all times. Plus, you want to have a, a dialogue with your associates, coworkers, and family about what it feels like to be victimized because of your identity. On the 80th anniversary of the signing of the Executive Order 9066, a lot of the problems that we faced back then, we still have now today. And we can all be a part of trying to mitigate that. In January 2022, San Jose Taiko moved from its studio space after 13 years. This video was part of a filming session to capture San Jose Taiko's energy in that space one more time before saying goodbye and thank you. This piece is called Golden Sky, written by Jeff Noon.
This is the 80th anniversary of Executive Order 9066, and it gives us something to ponder about, to think about how we think about justice in, the, in these really trying days and time, and what part we can do in making sure that what happened to us during World War II does not happen to others. I was um, born in Juneau, Alaska, and when the war broke out, when Pearl Harbor was attacked, uh, I was nine years old, and the next day the FBI came to our house, took my father away. Later he was sent to the Justice Department camp in New Mexico. The rest of our family um, was evacuated from Alaska the following April, and we were sent to an assembly center in Washington, Camp Harmony in Puyallup, Washington. And then we were later sent that summer, the month of August, to Minidoka, which was in Idaho. I was a child of nine and was imprisoned there until I was an adolescent of 13. In my next spirit was um, a mother of the family and um, she disappeared. She disappeared from, from our, our block. And uh, the family must have been aware of um, the stress that she was under. And we, our block was very close to the edge of the, the perimeter of the camp. And I can remember all of us running down from the block, running to the edge of the, um, the camp, going through the um, barbed wires and going a little further down, we're all running uh, to um, the Snake River. We, the Snake River was right outside of that part of the camp. And sure enough, she had, she, what she had done was she had weighed down her uh, body with stones and uh, had, had waded into the water and drowned herself. And I can remember that I can remember that and feeling that uh, how, uh, you know, how, how the stress that some people were under. And then kind of connecting with my, my mother, wondering what kind of a stress she was under. Would she do something like that at some point? Thank you, Alice, for that very moving remembrance. Her husband, Katz Hikido, participated in our last few Day of Remembrance programs, and we would like to honor Katz with this special tribute. your uh, interest in our uh, experience. So, so let me say that, you know, I believe that most Nisei who had the privilege to serve during World War II appreciated the opportunity because it was the best way to overcome the effects of racial prejudice to which we had been subjected before the war. Uh, because before the war, you know, uh, 
uh, uh, we were subjected to a great deal of uh, prejudice. You know, we could use public swimming pools. Uh, Issei and Nisei will get, uh, go to universities and colleges, get degrees in engineering or other technical fields. And when they graduated, uh, they could not get jobs in the chosen field because nobody would hire them because they were Japanese. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we could use public swimming, swimming pools. We couldn't buy homes in certain areas and uh, things like that. And uh, Colonel Walter Scamoro, who served with MIS, had similar sentiments when he said that uh, Nisei must realize that when the country is at war, uh, uh, the time we should serve our country without conditions or reservations. And he says, when the victory is won, the war is over, that is the time to fight for our rights. And uh, uh, how we succeed in that fight will depend on how well we serve the country during this time of need. And so, uh, so, that, so that was the fact that, uh, you know, our experience, I believe, in my own experience, to uh, help us to uh, in, in the war. Because uh, a sign of that, you know, when uh, July 1946, the 442nd returned home from Europe to America, and they marched up Constitution Avenue to the White House, where President Harry Truman presented the outfit with a seventh uh, unit citation. And as he pinned the uh, ribbons of the citation on the regiment's color, the president said, he says, uh, you are congratulated for what you have done. He says, you have fought the enemy overseas, you have fought prejudice here at home, and you have won. And he says, keep up the fight, and we continue to make this great country stand for what the Constitution says it stands for, for all of the people, all of the time. And so we felt we were vindicated. So thank you. Dear Nihon Machi Outreach Committee, other organizations in our coalition, and friends I haven't yet met, it is an honor and a privilege for me to be a part of this year's event, something I've done on several prior occasions. We're here today, as we are every year, to commemorate and remember that horrific day in 1942 in our nation's history, on which 120,000 Japanese Americans were forced into internment camps. The theme of this year's program, Overcoming Hate and Fear, the 80th anniversary of EO 9066, is apt not only because it described the environment at the time of President Franklin Roosevelt's fateful executive order, but because hate and fear are unfortunately alive and well today. In challenging the constitutionality of EO 9066, Oakland-born Fred Korematsu, just 23 years old at the time, stated that his rights and those of other Americans of Japanese descent had been violated. In Korematsu versus the United States, the Supreme Court ruled six to three in favor of the government, saying that military necessity overruled those civil rights. What is often lost in the narrative, however, is that although the order did not identify any particular group, it was clearly designed to remove and eventually incarcerate those Japanese aliens and American citizens of Japanese descent. Fast forward today, and it is extremely disappointing to see that hate and fear continue to exist across this great nation of ours. Just a few headlines from 2021. Anti-Asian hate crimes in the United States 
spiked 339%. New anti-voter laws appear designed to target people of color. More than 10,000 people reported to law enforcement last year that they were the victim of a hate crime because of their race or ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, religion, or disability. Through it all, however, we find hope and solace in the great work being done by the Nihon Machi Outreach Committee, civil liberty groups, faith-based organizations, and many others who are standing up for justice and against oppression. This work is not easy, and its fruits are not born overnight. For change takes time, effort, and people of conscience to stand up and rise together. We've seen this throughout history with leaders such as Susan B. Anthony, who fought tirelessly for voting rights and equal pay for women, and the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who fought against segregation and racism, and brave Japanese Americans like Fred Kuramatsu, Gordon Hirabayashi, and Min Yasui, who resisted and fought against the legality of detention all the way to the Supreme Court. Due to our shared experiences, the Muslim American community has stood side by side with our friends in the Japanese American community for decades, as you have done for us. And I know that we will both be united for a long, long time to come. We sincerely appreciate you allowing us to be a part of your day of remembrance. Together, we can and will overcome hate and fear. Thank you very much and God bless you. Amachi, Colorado, 7,318. Heart Mountain, Wyoming. 10,767. In Manzanar, California, 10,046. Minidoka, Idaho. 9,397.
Houston, Arizona, 17,814. Arkansas, 8,475. California, 18,789. Department of Justice and U.S. Army Camps. My name is Grace Shimizu. My father was a Japanese immigrant resident who was kidnapped from his home in Peru and interned in a Department of Justice concentration camp in Texas under the U.S. Latin American Extraordinary Rendition and Hostage Exchange Programs during World War II. I live in Oakland, California, which is in the traditional territory of Huchin, the ancestral and unceded or stolen land of the Lushan Ohlone people. I serve as the director of the Campaign for Justice, Redress Now for Japanese Latin Americans, and of the Japanese Peruvian Oral History Project. I'd like to share our Japanese Latin American or JLA Redress Update Report and the next steps in our justice struggle for U.S. government accountability and reparations. We need your help to help kick off Redress Phase 2, 
with our JLA Day of Action on February 24th. So what do we want? Well, we want justice. We want the U.S. government to be accountable for the civil and human rights violations, the war crimes, the crimes against humanity that it perpetrated against our families during World War II. We're talking about kidnapping or hostage taking, indefinite internment in U.S. concentration camps, forced labor, two hostage exchanges and being thrust as civilians into the war zones of the Far East forced deportation from the U.S. to war-devastated Japan under U.S. military occupation after the war. The denial of our rights of return to our homes and businesses in Peru and Latin America, and our bogus classification as illegal aliens to justify our internment, the exploitation of our labor, and the denial of our right to redress. How long must we wait for justice? We began our struggle 80 years ago in the U.S. concentration camps, seeking protection under the Geneva Convention as civilians during wartime. We've testified at congressional hearings, pursued five lawsuits, and two pieces of failed legislation. There has been no proper justice for us in the U.S. courts, the U.S. Congress, nor the White House. In 2003, we took the case of Art Shibayama and his two brothers to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, a body of the Organization of American States. This commission is a premier human rights body in the Americas, which serves as a venue of last resort when you cannot get justice in your own country. In 2020, this commission published its groundbreaking decision in favor of the Shibayama brothers. It affirms our right to redress and to reparations for government violations of human rights that occurred almost 80 years ago. It underscores that the principles of equality before the law, equal protection, and non-discrimination are among the most basic human rights, and that equal protection of the law applies to nationals and aliens alike and it ruled that the U.S. government owes meaningful, material, and moral redress to the JLAs for long-standing violation of human rights. The Trump and Biden administrations have refused to acknowledge the jurisdiction of the commission. Our requests for resolution have been ignored. Now is the time to bring pressure on the Biden administration to uphold international law and comply with the Commission's rulings. And never before have the U.S. people become aware and open to the need for national dialogue and reckoning with the deep racial divides, economic inequities, and political polarization, which are tearing our social fabric and undermining our democracy. We stand in solidarity with justice struggles for government accountability and reparations, including slavery reparations. What's our next step? Phase two of the historic Japanese American campaign for redress is underway. The signing of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 granted redress to Japanese Americans who were citizens or legal permanent residents for their World War II incarceration but the JLAs were excluded. Now, after the major victory with the commission decision, JLAs are calling upon everyone to build on the gains of phase one of the Japanese American redress movement and win redress for the Japanese Latin Americans. Please join us for the JLA Day of Action on Thursday, February 24th. We want the White House to be flooded with phone calls Go to the Campaign for Justice website, Facebook page, or Instagram page to get a sample script. And for more information about how you can become a part of this exciting campaign, because now is the time. Sign the JLA petition, donate, volunteer, do what you can, and let's secure JLA reparations together. Thank you.
Um, we were at church and uh, the announcement came out and everybody got very excited and people were saying, where's Pearl Harbor and, and all that kind of thing. Uh, we did go home uh, and my father had not gone to church. He had gone to a poetry reading uh, club that he uh, initiated in Seattle. So he was not home. Uh, when we got home, uh, and uh, oh, within a half hour or so, uh, uh, three FBI agents came to the house looking for my father. And we told them where he was, so two of them took off and went to go, go get him. And uh, the other one stayed in the house to search through the house. And that one person searched through the entire house and picked up all kinds of photos and anything written in Japanese and uh, that kind of thing uh, throughout the house. So we did not see my father again for quite a while. Uh, they picked him up at the meeting where he was uh, involved and uh, put him into a jail cell in the same building where he worked as an interpreter for the U.S. Immigration Department. Well, that picture was uh, taken by the uh, Seattle Times. And um, it was a group of us, including our family and friends, that were loading on the bus to go to camp. Uh, the thing I just vaguely remember about it was that they photographer who was what, taking photos and um, uh, he asked, he said, smile. So uh, my sister ended up smiling and the rest of us were kind of nonchalant. And uh, it end up, ended up in the New York, uh, Seattle Times. And it said, uh, note smiling faces, a lesson to Tokyo as if, look how happy everybody is. And of course, uh, you know, everybody that was involved in the fo photo was not uh, very happy at all. Well, you know, I was only nine, and um, it was something that, as far as I knew, it was something that my family was doing. We were going someplace. I really didn't know the impact of the whole thing. That is that we were going to a camp, you know, to a concentration camp, basically. The following public service announcement pays tribute to the Japantown community for continuing to look out for each other during the pandemic. San Jose Taiko will perform Daiko Kai which means great journey. I'm Aggie Itamoto, and um, I was born and raised in Watsonville, California. I was a year old when Pearl Harbor ha happened, and so I joined my family, and we stayed at the Salinas Rodeo Grounds as a temporary assembly center. 
because they didn't know what to do with us. And then from there, we hopped onto a train and we went to the middle of the desert in Arizona. Poston was our, quote, camp that we were incarcerated in. It was a hot place to be. I remember Obachang, my grandmother, her face was red and swollen from the 120 degree heat that we were suffering. Surprisingly, nobody complained. Nobody complained. We just endured. Korairu is the Japanese word for it. There wasn't much recreation in camp unless you played marbles or ran around looking in um, the creek. But my father walked out to the middle of the desert in Arizona and he found a piece of manzanita wood. Manzanita is heavy and he brought it back to the barracks room where we were staying and carved this beautiful goat board. And the goat means five. And if you have these beads and put five in a row, then you're the winner. There are similar games like that in other cultures too. So this is a treasure that I have on my coffee table to remember Poston because this came straight from the deserts of Poston and my father made it. And when we came back, my mom said sometimes people found it even harder to come back because we had no house and no job. My father was um, a sharecropper with Driscoll in Watsonville. And so we slowly made our way back I got involved with the Japanese American Museum because I wanted our story to never be forgotten. And so I, I was an educator and I also remember the time when school textbooks never even mentioned it until the late 80s when the state uh, superintendent of schools said, we're not adopting any textbooks that don't address the controversial issues being Japanese American incarceration and the Jewish concentration camps. This is a remembrance of what happened to us, and we hope you all will remember that. My name is Susan Hayasa, and I'm one of the co-founders of San Jose Nikkei Resistors. Thank you, Nock, for your leadership organizing the annual Day of Remembrance. The theme, Overcoming Hate and Fear, name something that we recognize. During the 2016 presidential campaign, various politicians on the national stage held for the rounding up and incarceration of Muslims and Syrian refugees, and after the election, called for the Muslim ban, the incarceration of migrant children, and the terror of ICE deportation raids. We formed San Jose Nikkei Resistors in order to unite and mobilize local Japanese Americans against these attacks. We knew that we needed to bring our community together, across generations and diverse backgrounds, including Sansei, who were part of the movement for redress and reparations in the 1980s, including some former incarcerees in their 70s and 80s, including people raising young children, and including young people just starting their careers. Together, we developed work in a vigorous defense of civil liberties and social justice. Kelsey is one of those people who stepped forward. For the past one and a half years, she has participated in and she's been the chairperson of our Committee on Reimagining Public Safety. Please welcome Kelsey Ichikawa. When you ask people what they think of when you say Japantown, a lot of them will say the Manju or the Tofu or the Obon Festival. But for me, I think about community care. I think about the way older generations survived displacement and dispossession by building community care structures that help them thrive. And I think about the efforts of San Jose Nikkei Resistors and others to continue that work. Now, I'm relatively new here. Growing up, I never went to the Buddhist temple. I never played basketball with the other Yonseis. And honestly, as a kid, I only came to San Jose Japantown occasionally to eat at Minato's and try and collect enough tickets to get that stationary set I coveted. Being Japanese American was just something I checked on the ethnicity question but any real sense of participation in a community was elusive. And so I joined San Jose Nikkei Resistors because of an itch to figure out how to do political work, not just as an Asian American, but as a four and a half generation Japanese American woman. 
And through working with the longtime active residents of San Jose Japantown, I learned about the rich history of this place. For example, that the Issei Memorial Building, where I'm standing now, was formerly a hospital that provided culturally specific health care for Japanese immigrants. Or how the UI Kai Senior Care Facility, where my uncle used to volunteer, emerged from the Sansei and Nisei's hot meal program for older Iseis. During World War II and after, politicians and white supremacists wanted to break up and assimilate so-called ethnic enclaves like J-Town. My own sense of alienation from the Japanese American community has been an intentional product of those policies across the generations. That's why it was very powerful for me to understand from the local history here how Japanese Americans resisted those forces in many ways. With very little help from the government, we built a new Japan town alongside the Pinoy town, Chinese businesses, and black churches. We established legal services, fought for official redress from the state, and tried our best to help each other heal from the harms inflicted, including through events like Day of Remembrance. That is, to resist xenophobic, racist hate and fear, we had to create organizations, services, and cultural events that nourished us, that tried to meet the needs of those who were socially isolated, traumatized from camp, and economically vulnerable. So too now. This year, we experienced the alarming rise in anti-Asian hate incidents that Cynthia Choi explained. You've heard this about the safety patrols from Rich. Japantown residents have been experiencing harassment, theft, and physical attacks. And in SJNR, we wanted to know why. What were the underlying causes of this? We ultimately found that the severe lack of stable and affordable housing and lack of mental health care drove many of the incidents that made people feel unsafe. The so-called villain here was much more complicated and systemic than a caricatured racist out for blood. Media conversations promoted narratives that pit Asians and blacks against each other and called for more policing or vigilanteism. But we knew the solution could not depend on carceral systems, which punish people and treat them as disposable, instead of addressing the roots of violence. Police and jails are anti-black by nature, and what's more, come from the very same systems that facilitated Japanese American incarceration. So instead, we sought ways to build up our community care structures. We advocated for mental health and behavioral health services from the county. We collaborated with local practitioners to host workshops on restorative justice practices, bystander intervention, and de-escalation. For me, it was humbling to realize how much I had to learn and to see the large interest from people from around the South Bay. We realized that people are craving these kinds of education and care skills, ways to meet each other's needs and vulnerabilities with community support instead of state or police violence. It's time for us to move in solidarity and fight for no strings attached permanent housing policies, fight for adequate and abundant healing spaces, and fight to reimagine public safety on our own terms. And it's not just about individual policies, it's also about taking an expansive, thoughtful approach to being in community. From walking with the safety patrols, meeting people over coffee at Roy's, and organizing in SJNR, I've learned that San Jose Japantown is a community that is multiracial, multi-faith, and multi-generational. Thanks to my friends in SJNR, it's a place and space that I now feel deeply connected to. It includes those of us whose families experienced incarceration, those who didn't, those helping Japanese American and diasporic cultures flourish, those living here, including those who are unhoused or who need regular mental health services and substance use treatment. As new development and commercial interests foreshadow an uncertain future here, and we see the continual effects of the staggering economic inequality in the Silicon Valley, we have to think about what Japantown is and what we want it to be. Together, we must imagine a world without cages.
without police violence or prisons, a world where Japantown's community remains strong, rooted in a physical space, imbued by history, where each and every one of us has access to life-giving resources, care, and relationships. Imagining that world is not a fantasy, but a necessity. And we invite you to join us in the vision and the work, because we certainly can't do this without each other. Here in the Issei Memorial Building, the walls are old. The wood speaks and cracks and creaks, remembering its birth as a seed. The black cat has nine, a human gets one. But how many lives does a room get? How many lives does it hold? The echoes of a hospital, the sick who came, Heartbeats heard by doctors, reassuring in a tongue they understood. A reminder of home where the sun rises. Here, politicians were made. Bread was broken at a table. Drumbeats punctuated thought. Resistance machinated. And I come to a seven o'clock meeting, masked to stay the disease. Sitting beneath frames hanging with news cuttings, reparation checks, as we talk about what J-Town means to us. How you couldn't fit it in a history book. I wonder, if not for the place, whether I would ever have found my way to them. It is strange and wonderful and seems impossible, like dew that swells on maple branches waffling between cohesion and splatter. Here in the Issei Memorial Building, the benches are laden with weight from ones who sat and rested. Returning from camp, the road led here, momentary, hostile, as fragments of life spun back together. We remember how the trees, now touching sky, were once seeds held in our palms, tenuous, uncertain of becoming. How the gone, the living, fought for every garden and floorboard here. And how we survived with a chance to care for each other another day. My birth certificate has my place of birth as Roar, Arkansas. So, you know, I knew that from early on, but I didn't, I didn't really know what that meant. All I kind of knew was, you know, I was born in camp. And I didn't really know the significance of that until much later in, in my adult life and my association with JCL and attending a number of the Day of Remembrances, you know, I slowly learned about the incarceration and the fact that, you know, I was a, a victim of it. So one of the odd things was, you know, when whenever you go online and you have to put in security questions and stuff, a lot of them ask you, you know, where were you born? And you know, I, I have to put in like Roar, Arkansas because of the incarceration. Had it not been for that, I would be putting in Stockton, California because that's where my parents were and that's where they returned, but they were forced to leave there. So I was born in Roar, Arkansas. And you know, that sticks with me. In 1942, as the result of Executive Order 9066, my parents, both of whom were Nisei, born and raised in the U.S., 
along with my older brother, who was less than a year old at the time, were forced to move from their home in Stockton and relocated to the Rower, Arkansas concentration camp. I was born there in 1943, so I belong in a category of those who were too young to have any personal memories of the camp. Also, like many others, my parents did not talk about the incarceration experience, so I really grew up unaware that I had been a victim of one of the great miscarriages of the Constitution in U.S. history. My father was one of the early Nisei professionals, having set up a dental practice in Stockton. After the war, we moved to Kansas City, Missouri for about two years, where he worked as a dental technician to earn enough money to get us back to Stockton, where fortunately he was able to reestablish his dental practice. I too was fortunate in that I was able to start school in Stockton in kindergarten, where five-year-olds are too young to be racist. So I really didn't experience any anti-Japanese racism then, or really throughout my school years. So you might say that our family survived the incarceration relatively unscathed. Still, I feel that I have one major impact in that it closed the door to our family history because not only did my parents not talk about the incarceration, but they really didn't talk about the past in general. So it was not until it was too late that I really consider my parents to be more than just my parents and to be people who had stories to their lives. And unfortunately, those are stories that I am never going to know. If you ask anybody, would you be willing to uproot your life, leave everything behind for an undetermined amount of time and be shipped off to an undetermined place and be vilified as, as undesirable and, and treacherous people? And for that, you know, 40 years later, you get an apology and $20,000. Would you make that trade off? I mean, even if you allow for inflation, would you do that? I don't think anybody would, and I certainly wouldn't. It should never happen. It should never have happened. It should never happen again, you know. And that's why we need to keep remembering it so people know that it actually did happen and it can't happen again. In 2007, Nihonmachi Outreach Committee co-hosted an event with Wesley United Methodist Church that presented a conversation about LGBT rights and the church. And throughout the years, Wesley UMC has spoken up on other issues such as racism, peace, and human rights. I'm pleased to introduce a performance, Roll Down Justice, by the Wesley United Methodist Church Virtual Choir.
hope that you've enjoyed our program. You have heard from a few people who are working in their communities to combat hate and fear. You have also heard from several members of the Japanese American community who were locked up behind barbed wire and felt the harsh sting of racism, anger, and distrust. Because we are the recipients of an official apology from our government, we pledge to fight for Japanese Latin Americans who were left out of that apology, and we will continue to speak out and defend other communities when they become the target of hate and discrimination. Now we will hear from Rimban General Sakamoto of the San Jose Buddhist Church Betsuin, who will close the program with a final meditation. For thousands of years, we have sought peace. And for thousands of years, the instruction for peace has been to be peace. We have known that anger feeds the fire of fear and hatred. In the Dhammapada, the following verse is found. Overcome the angry with non-anger. Overcome the wicked by goodness. Overcome the miser by generosity. Overcome the liar by truth. To transform anger and hate, I must be peace. Thich Nhat Hanh said, the practice of peace and reconciliation is one of the most vital and artistic of human actions. We in our own thoughts and speech and action must be peace. May all beings be happy. May they be joyous and live in safety. It isn't like we were floundering in community and then we had to go to camp and then we made this miraculous recovery. It, 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 would, it would have been ongoing uh, uh, if it weren't for the racism and the hatred that was there. So what we were in, this is one of the things, is internment camps are legal, federal, and international things. That there's a international policy that says if, if I go to war with your country and you're living here, and I suspect you of supporting the war effort on that side, I could put you in an internment camp. And you could do the same for me in Japan. That's just international law. What happened to us, the, all the other camps, there's no international law. There was no oversight. Geneva Convention oversees all the Department of Justice internment camps. So when my father was removed from us in Tule Lake, first he's put in the, put in the jail. So we have pictures of him in the jail. Um, and then put into the internment camp in North Dakota, Bismarck, North Dakota. Uh, those internment camps were way better. They're red brick buildings, they had steam heat, uh, they had a swimming pool, because uh, the US government wanted to make sure that the Americans that were held over there were treated well. So they treated the enemy aliens, that's what they're called, well here, otherwise they would be punished. The, the Americans over there would be punished. They didn't realize is that nobody in Japan wanted my father because he was an American citizen. He, if he came over, he was probably going to be a spy for the U.S. <laughs> Such crazy stuff. Do you know what I remember the most? I'm only three years old, right? 
is the fear on my mother's face. You don't have to tell me anything. I don't have to understand any of it. But a child knows fear of their parents. And that's what sticks to me the most, is the fear on my mother's face. But everything was positive, and while growing up, everything was positive. But the people that resisted or they deemed not loyal to the U.S. were sent to this one particular camp. They were then deported. A number of them were deported back to Japan. So it's, you know, it's what's happening today, you know? And that's what's so sad. You see, you hear about the Hispanic families being broken up, and you know the parents are just taken away, locked up, and it's awful. I mean, kids are kids. And kids get along or they fight. The older kids, because I was in grade school, I was in first grade or whatever. Uh, whereas the older kids, high school kids, they were very much discriminated against initially. This is in Seabrook Farm, Jersey. And yeah, they. But in Seabrook, I say it's unique because of the Europeans, right? They were displaced people from Europe. So the Estonians, the Hungarians, the Polish, the Latvians, many different ethnic groups. The southern um, uh, migrant farmers, uh, migrant laborers, not farmers, from the south of the Appalachian Mountains would come to Seabrook during the harvest season. in a community that is in a rural setting that was very much like an urban setting of a lot of mixed cultures. So we grew up learning different languages and the Estonians were probably the most and largest group of that came but it's totally a mixed community and we were all in the same boat, poor. <laughs> or we're trying to reestablish ourselves. A new beginning because it was a new beginning for many people. We didn't realize that growing up as kids. You know, we grew up with different ethnic groups. And that became really a pride. Looking back on the history, is that you know we were able to get along. All the different cultures were all in the same boat in the sense of trying to recoup from the war. And so we managed. <laughs> 